what we talked about with our colleagues uh, yesterday was a lot about what is it we're going to do. Um, and what we're hearing, you know, this morning from, from Lynn and Paul is a lot about um, how are we going to do it? Uh, how should it be done? So if you think about, you know, we've made some choices or will be making choices about what needs to be done. Um, we're getting smarter about how to do it. Then um, we have a challenge about organizing ourselves, organizing our institutions, our structures in order to deliver um, those choices uh, in the right way, in the most effective fashion. So um, the connection I have here to, I think, what's been happening over the last uh, day uh, and morning is, is actually about that kind of uh, structure. Um, what are the ways in which the research library is going to restructure itself in order to deliver on a different kind of strategy and deliver on a different kind of value? Um, and I'm going to tell you all that in 15 minutes, um, more or less. So uh, the, the way our entry point on this, um, uh, what I've just said to you is actually a back formation uh, because that's not the way we came at this in, in, in the first place. The, the way we came at it was uh, because we watch what's going on in the community and what we were seeing is a lot of institutions of, um, reorganizing themselves, restructuring themselves. In some cases, it was we were seeing some you know, radical or innovative or different kinds of uh, organizational structures emerge. In other cases, what we were seeing was new senior management portfolios being put together that you know, were considerably different than you know, things that we'd seen in the past. Um, you know, I, th I think one of the aha moments was when the people at Penn State created a, 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 a senior library a management position that combined uh, the digital responsibility for the Digital Humanities Center and special collections and archives. And we thought, well, that's interesting. Um, and then you start looking around the landscape and a lot of that was happening. So, um, so we use that as a reason to reach out and say, hey, are any of you restructuring? Any of you reorganizing? And we pushed it out to the partnership and, and about 65 institutions wrote back to me and said, yeah, we're doing that, we're doing that. Now, you know, when you sort through it, mm, you know, some of it's pretty just garden variety, you know, regular course of business, but, but some of it was in fact, you know, major restructurings. So what I'm gonna talk about um, quickly is, has a little bit to do with charts, uh, uh, a lot more to do with structure and, um, and, and with organization. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll tease out some of the, you know, the motivations, et cetera. Uh, the thing you're looking at here um, uh, was, was also part of what inspired us. Um, this, um, th this is the, the, the first or organizational chart that you can find in, for United States uh, Enterprise. It was for, uh, um, for the New York and Erie Railroad. And uh, the fellow who did it was one of the uh, one of the superintendents of the railroad, and, and he, he did it as a consequence of, of basically finding out that um, they, they were, uh, you know, horrifically cost inefficient, um, and, and so they tried to organize themselves um, and did it in, in an interesting way. So, uh, you know, it's still pretty traditional. Uh, you, you had, you know, the president and board of directors in charge, um, but, but, but this is kind of inverted. They're down at the bottom of the chart instead of up at the top, the hierarchical thing. Um, but his innovative thing was that he separated out, um, which you probably can't read here in the middle, which is um, people who were d responsible for individual rail lines. And then over on the sides, which you see, are people who were responsible for common kinds of resources. So, you know, the folks who were in charge of engine repairs or the people who were in charge of getting the wood for the rail ties. So instead of that stuff being distributed all over the place, it got centralized and the superintendents who were in charge of the individual lines could count on it. Um, you know, you, you go further up the line and, and, and they devolved all the responsibilities down to the level of the, you know, the individual station agent. You know, the station agent's the one who ought to be um, responsible for the foreman and the laborers and stuff, not some person way far away. Um, so so uh, what, what, what they were doing 
was, was basically structuring themselves to accomplish a particular strategy. So um, th this, this notion that structure follow strategy was what kind of motivated us to say, let's talk to these folks and find out um, in the libraries whether in fact um, the structures they're crafting are following strategy. Now, you know, we, we talked amongst ourselves and we thought, this is a very clever question. Aren't we good at, you know, you know that's our hypothesis, structure follows strategy. Um, well, it turns out, of course, you know, that there's an enormous business literature that's based on, you know, structure following strategy. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure that this happens a lot of times. You think, oh, aren't I clever? And then it turns out, you, you know, yeah, you're, you're in a chain of cleverness rather than, you know, <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the front end of it. Um, so, so, but, so the interesting thing I thought that, 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 and the takeaway here was, you know, that, that yes, structure follows strategy. Um, the other thing that happens is that our structure never really get changed, they just get layered and moved around. So, you, you know, every organizational structure, I mean, if you put it in library terms, is actually a palimpsest of, you know, the history of the enterprise. Um, there's always little bits left, you know, that have gotten layered. Because um, most organizations start out pretty simple, um, you know, and um, I mean, even a, even a simple chart like this is, is more complicated than uh, than than is necessary. Um, so, so one thing: structure follows strategy, um, and you've got all the residuals that that continue to stick to the structure even after you've decided to change things, um, which of course results in this complexity. So. Um, I'm, I'm telling you this because I think if you reflect on your own circumstances, you'll, you'll see this playing out. So where does the complexity in organizational structures come from? Usually it comes from growth. Uh, sometimes it's like, whoa, we got a lot more to, to handle than we thought, therefore, you know, we spawn another group to deal with it. Um, or, oh, you, you know, we're going to enter a new market, so you, you know, you, you spawn an entire new structure over there to handle that new market. Um, or you, you say, well, we're really good at X, and that's pretty related to Y, so let's do Y as well. And you get into an adjacent business, and it spawns all that stuff. Um, so, so, so if you think about, think about the, the new stuff that, um, that we've been talking about over the last couple of days, um, you know, data management, you know, research uh, support, et cetera. Um, you, you know, are, are these new markets? Are they adjacent businesses? Um, probably both in some ways. And uh, you, we're not gonna be different than other folks. We're gonna follow similar patterns and spawn similar kinds of structures, et cetera, to accommodate these things. So one, one reason things get complex is because of these different growth factors. Another, um, which is, uh, I didn't know it was a law, but now I know it's a law, um, the law of requisite variety, um, which is a great name for the fact that um, as, you, as you deal with your external constituencies and you actually either proliferate how many constituents you're dealing with or you get smarter about the, the, those external constituencies, you spawn internal uh, entities in order to respond to them. So you think about uh, mar marketing is a, is a really good example. So um, I don't know, you're in the food business. Well, okay, I got two markets, you know, adults and children. Um, well, that's one way. But now you think about, uh, about it and you, you, you actually have this incredible segmentation. Um, you know, it's not just kids and adults. It's Hispanic mothers with teenagers. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's um, uh, uh, college students with a microwave or whatever. And, and what happens is you, you change inside entities in order to deal with those, you know, small segments. Now, it's not a bad thing. I'm, I'm just explaining it, it. It requires complexity then if you're gonna deal with things and be responsive at that level. Um, so, Structure, follow strategy, you have these kind of built-in complexities that uh, drivers of complexity. Um, and you also have to remember 
uh, which unfortunately I think a lot of us forget, is you know, structure is not an organization. Um, you know, st strategy may drive structure, but, but w what's really hard is to get all the rest of the stuff in line in order to uh, support it. So you know, you know, the balance of people, rewards, internal processes, all that stuff. Uh, hard to believe that anybody got a trademark on this, but if you're McKinsey and company, you just have a little stamp that you hit everything with a trademark stamp. Um, uh, so, but, but, but the thing to remember here is aligning and effectiveness um, uh, as, as we change these structures. So the final thing um, I think to keep in mind uh, that's happened in, in organizational structure is um, in, over the last 20 years, you've seen um, people redesigning structures around customer-centeredness, um, moving uh, business processes to the back, pushing customer-oriented units to the front. Um, so people, so, so you can really concentrate on uh, those micro segments, you can really be responsive to the constituencies that, that uh, are, are important and are going to uh, drive your business. Um, I think we've got some analogies to this happening in our library structures and, and library organization now. Um, so, the, the, the 10 minutes and now you have the entire theory of organizational structure. Thank me later. Um, <laughs> So if you think about that, that's very similar. That, that, that customer orientation is the final bit of, uh, of, of uh, organizational structural refinement. It's very similar to a thing that Lorcan pointed out a long, long time ago and, and that we've been uh, talking uh, about in the library community, that as the network disintermediates things, it's basically unbundling the enterprise. It's unbundling the corporation. Uh, you know, we had always in a single entity, pull together things, basically three, three components, you know, the customer relationship management, the products and innovation, and, you know, the infrastructure to deliver it. The network disintermediates that and basically allows people to have just one of those things instead of having to have all three of them. And, and what's happening, I think, is in these structural uh, realignments that are happening, is people are, are, are actually acting on this. They're saying the business I'm in, in a library, is actually in customer relationship management. I'm, 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 I'm here to be responsive to customers. I may be delivering services that I rely on getting from someplace else. Uh, that doesn't matter. You know, my, my specialty, the thing that I'm going to be valued for is, is my understanding of the local constituency and the way I uh, uh, respond to them. Uh, so now, um, isn't that a great chart? This is the, the University of Kansas libraries. Um, besides having an interesting palette, they, um, uh, they very overtly decided to restructure themselves around um, uh, user focus. Um, now, the things I pull out here for you, um, three things. Um, one is they, they created a, a thing called the Lear Research and Learning Division. And if you look at, at what's in there, it's basically the centers that will be responsive to these micro segments. Um, you know, the Center for Graduate Initiatives and Engagement, the Office of Scholarly Communication, et cetera. Um, I mean, these, are, these are institutes that, that share a common purpose of responsiveness to particular micro segments, but, but, but they also have some things in common, so grouping them together this way makes a lot of sense. Um, they pulled out innovation and strategy and said, you know, we actually need to explicitly monitor that and, and deliver on it, and, and it's something that's of value within the whole organization. Um, and they, and they um, uh, uh, acknowledged that a lot of their success on an ongoing basis is going to be due to cross-functional initiatives, and so they made a space for that. These are things that you know, are going to gather people across silos, do this task, go away. Um, this is another, uh, uh, um, uh, I, I think, really interesting example of redesign around uh, customer uh, centeredness. So this is from Delft. Vilma was here yesterday, but not today. So 
Um, so she won't, won't know how enthusiastic I am about this. Um, plus, good palate, huh? Um, so here's the two things I'd yank out of this. Um, they, they, they pulled together and they, they said, we're going to manage our, what we deliver to our constituency as, as basically you know, business line. Uh, a, a, a set of business lines, library products and services. So, you know, we're going to manage our open spaces like a product uh, and, and, and a deliverable. We're going to manage research data services. Um, and again, these things get grouped together um, uh, despite the fact that they're responding to, uh, to segments, they get grouped together uh, because they, they, they will share certain kinds of, um, uh, of infrastructure and, 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 and supporting knowledge. Um, they've also uh, uh, acknowledged that they need an innovation group, a development group, uh, uh, people who are going to keep an eye on you know, those changes to the customer, uh, consumer technology uh, environment, see how that ought to influence their own design of services, et cetera. Um, and my favorite bit um, is um, Vilma, the library director, has her own bubble. It's actually not a bubble, it's a cloud. Um, and, 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 and in, you know, uh, in a heartwarming kind of cuteness, that's, it's a cloud because it floats around. Um, Vilma doesn't have an office. She just sits down wherever there's space. Um, I think that's brilliant. Um, so my observations after talking to lots and lots of uh, these folks actually um, I didn't talk to all 60, but I talked to about 20, 20 institutions in depth uh, about the motivations, the drivers, well, you know, their processes, how they were going to uh, move forward on, on these organizational changes, uh, is the following. So all of them acknowledged that they were changing their structure because they had a, 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 a change in strategy and they, they wanted to adapt to it. Um, almost to a person. Um, they did not, uh, they were motivated and triggered by some external event. They didn't just come to this and say, it's time for us to redo. Um, um, the, the external events might have been the university just articulates a new strategic plan or the university, you know, uh, had an early retirement program or, you know, something like that. Um, so there was some external event, and, and they, they used it as the, the opportunity to, um, uh, to, to make a change. Uh, almost uh, across the board, the, the defining characteristics of, of these restructurings were to make the organization more user-centered, um, uh, accomplishing the kinds of things that Lynn was talking about, Paul was talking about. Um, uh, and and to, to, to overtly align themselves with some university direction. I mean, in some cases, they, they would name a department after you know, the, 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 the directional um, uh, 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 goal that the university had set. Uh, again, in almost all cases, people, in order to do this, they, they, they were bringing in uh, skill sets that were outside of the normal library uh, package, um, which has a, a whole set of other challenges and is a different conversation. But 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 to be user centered and 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 aligned in this way, they knew that they were going to need those new skill sets, um, and um, many of them were explicitly charging a senior manager with responsibility for external services that, that they were going to rely on. In some cases, these were consortial services or national services, but it was basically like supply chain management. You know, For us to succeed, these things have got to be in line and somebody needs to look after it. Uh, let me move ahead. Um, Almost all the things that we talked about over the last day or two, data management, research support, various flavors of, um, the various flavors of publishing, research assessment, support, et cetera, uh, those, those services showed up in almost everybody's new structure. They showed up at different places sometimes, depending on, the, uh, depending on what the university wanted to, or what the library wanted to um, uh, emphasize. And uh, so, 
when I say we're making choices about what to do, all of us may do some of it, but some of us will say, this is core business for me. Others will say, well, I've got a place, I gotta have a place for these people to go. And so you see the specific gravity of the service being different at different institutions and not necessarily even called the same thing. I mean, if you unpack it, you'll go, oh, that's a, that's a research data support position, but it might be called something that you, you wouldn't necessarily recognize, um, which I think uh, it is, it means that we're still a little ways away from actually having a community of practice around these, these new, new and emerging skills. Um, we, don't, we don't have the same vocabulary. We don't yet have uh, a common shared idea of what the, what the underpinning skill sets that need to be bundled together to do the job are. Um, um, they're not placed in the same uh, part of the structure. Um, so it's going to be harder, I think, for these people to find one another and for, for best practices and, 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 and expectations to emerge. Uh, and here, if you, if, here's, here's what they all had in common in terms of um, success essentials. You know, all of them are in advance of restructuring articulated some set of principles. You know, this is stuff that we, you know, believe or these are design principles that we all subscribe to. Um, uh, the, the, everybody had those in their pocket. They, they didn't start with the structure. They started with some sort of principles. Uh, they might have been goals. They might have been objectives. They might have been even higher level. Um, I was going to quote some of the ones that, that were part of the Delft um, restructuring, but Wil Vilma gave them to me in Dutch, and I ran them through Google Translate. And they were just, <laughs> and they were just hysterical, but they weren't <laughs> helpful. Um, uh, so principles. Um, they did all of the management in advance. So the, the library director who, who knew restructuring was in their future prefigured it up to their management structure and they, they telegraphed it down as well. You know, they didn't have a plan. They didn't say it's going to be X, but they said things are going to change. You know, here's why. Are you behind me? You know, things are going to change you know, expect it uh, downward. So there was a lot of, of advanced management and, and uh, complete communication, um, sort of before, during, after, uh, uh, which was important to the success. And interestingly enough, all of them had some kind of master space plan in their back pocket. Didn't mean that they were, could afford it. Didn't mean they were, you know, they were ready to do it. You know, money might have been, been, been out there. But when they were doing the restructure, they, they could say, look, this is in, in anticipation of where we're going to wind up. Um, and everybody knew that that was the, the aspiration. Um, so having a, that master space plan was, w w really cleared uh, uh, a way forward for things that you might not otherwise have been able to do or that people might not otherwise have understood. So that's um, uh, what I think uh, the takeaways are if you're, if you're preparing. Then they had all this in line, and when the event or opportunity occurred, they were ready to go. Um, so uh, yeah, structure follows strategy, and uh, people were and are um, uh, explicitly changing in order to match up with those changes in, in, in research and education that we've been talking about. You know, to make themselves more valuable and explicitly align with the, the local university success criteria. Um, what's going to make our university great? You know, it's X. We're here to help uh, make that happen. Um, and um, uh, to try and create a structure that allows the library to respond to the expectations uh, that are changing and emerging from the, uh, the constituencies along the lines that Paul and, and Lynn just described. Um, so there's, there's takeaways here that I think we can, we can learn from one another in this regard uh, in, in, in terms of embodying our choices in ways that are effective and actually uh, support our future success. Thanks. <laughs>